This whole series is set up to help you learn how to scale smarter and faster in 2022. And today we're focusing on product innovation and sourcing. My name's Erica Krause. I'm the head of brand and community at 8Fig. One of our passions at 8Fig is to help sell sellers uh, hit that maximum potential um, and hit their goals. If you're trying to get to six figures, seven figures, eight figures, or sell, we want to do everything we can to help you do that. We've brought in an amazing panel today, um, including my fellow host, Liron Hirschkorn, who's um, supporting us as we run through this whole series. And then we're also going to introduce our other panelists who are absolute experts in this topic, and you're going to really enjoy hearing from them. But Liron, I'm going to pass to you to introduce yourself first. Thank you. Thanks so much for uh, having me and uh, for joining the, the webinar. Um, I'm Liran Hirschkorn. I'm the CEO and founder of Incrementum Digital, um, a seller myself as well, and have been in the e-commerce and more specifically Amazon uh, space over the last uh, seven years. So I'm excited to, to be here. Um, I'll share one of my, uh, one of my product sourcing failures uh, shortly as well, which I, I think you'll find um, interesting and probably uh, others here have experienced something similar and we'll talk more about how to kind of um, possibly uh, avoid that. Um, and uh, yeah, would love to uh, have Nathan Resnick uh, of Sourceify come on and uh, introduce himself. Thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, Nathan Resnick. I founded Sourceify about five years ago. I've been manufacturing products uh, in and out of China for 12 years. I used to live over there in 2010 uh, and 2012 and really excited to be here to share my experience about running my own e-commerce brands and manufacturing thousands of different types of products uh, through Sourceify. Awesome. I want to also welcome Benjamin Hopwood. Um, Benjamin, do you mind introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about what you do? Sure. So I'm Benjamin Hopwood. I'm the head of supply chain at Gemba. Uh, Prior to this, I uh, was in China for, uh, for roughly 17 years, working in and out of the APAC region in sourcing and logistics, larger groups like Walmart, uh, Caterpillar, also a lot of small to medium-sized groups as well. Um, so currently right now, the uh, Gemba is a managed marketplace. We uh, work with groups all the way from people that are just getting started into this space all the way up to about $50 million as those it's kind of our sweet spot in terms of in terms of working with groups, and we really focus on the product journey. So, so what does it look like to to create new functionality uh, in products and or to find growth hacks to, to 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 really put together your supply chain and other things to move fast? Amazing. And then we're also joined by Sajag. Sajag, would you introduce yourself as well and let everybody know who you are and what um, Mobley is all about? Hey everybody, I'm the founder of Mobley. Uh, so Mobley, what we're doing is we give you a full service quality control team for the cost of inspection uh, in China. So mainly product inspections in China. Uh, a little bit about me. So before I started working on inspections and quality control, uh, I used to be an Amazon seller myself. I've been in e-commerce for over a decade now. Started with eBay, then went into Amazon, and then later went uh, started my own brand. Uh, faced a lot of quality control problems firsthand, uh, you know, watched a lot of bad inspections and had a lot of bad inventory and then uh, ended up actually living in Shenzhen, China for a little bit of time as well. And, uh, and that's how I ended up starting Mobley. Awesome. Well, it's obvious already that we've got um, a stellar uh, group of people here with incredible amount of experience in sourcing and um, specifically in China, where a lot of you guys are already sourcing from. Um, so uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. The first thing I want to kick off with, we're obviously going to spend a lot of time talking about optimizing. A lot of people are already selling. They're already sourcing. They're wanting to scale. But before we do, for those early sellers in the room, I'd love to, to ask a question about how do you even know how to get started? How do you know which product to source, where to source, how to source? Like if you're at like ground zero and just getting started, what do you want to be thinking about? So um, I'll, I'll just jump in on this. You know, I think there's a, a couple different ways on how sort of people end up end up with a product. Um, I've generally seen two ways people people sort of arrive arrive at a product. There's um, there are those that um, are data driven and are kind of data data first, right? They they don't have a particular they don't they're not focused on something that they're particularly interested in or passionate about. They're basically looking at the data and finding where there's potentially more 
demand that there, than there is supply or where there's an opportunity to improve something, whether that's reading the reviews on Amazon or um, you know figuring out search volume around keywords and, and where the data is. Um, and then the other side is somebody who has this major problem. Um, you know, I'm thinking of you know a product like uh, there's a product on Shark Tank where people this guy invented something that protects the space in the car between you and you know the 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 cup holder right where like all the things drop and he developed this like simple product that you just put there and prevents things from dropping it's like a personal i, I need that product by the way <laughs> yes yeah so I you think, can send me the link afterwards <laughs> um and, and you know developing a product from sort of like a, a, a need and something innovative that's not uh you know on the um on the market um the area where i've seen people kind of fail is is having that innovative idea or looking at something but not do but not then backing it up with data right like doing the research is do people actually want this is there actually um a need for this um you know and i i've i, I can share an example of that as well maybe after after a couple other people chime in on, on a product that i've seen recently um and actually had the opportunity to buy but i passed up on because it was innovative but i didn't think there was actually any any demand for it I think that's a really good point. I would also add, you know, right now I see and in, in, as Sourcefy, we work with a lot of brands that have partnered with celebrities or influencers to create a community around their product. And so, you know, I think if you have an existing community that you can tie in a product to, that's a great win. Or if you have a connection to a, you know, large celebrity or influencer that, you know, you can develop a product with that will target their audience in a great way. I think that's also going to be a huge win. Yeah, no, I'm a huge fan of the kind of community driven aspect because, um, you know, I feel like some of the biggest brands are kind of niche and, uh, you know, they kind of find their, their land and they find their people and they just build a cult around it. Um, so if you're able to build a, build a cult around your products, I mean, you're going to be in business for a very long time. Uh, so like Facebook groups, uh, one way that I've seen work really well is like uh, I had a friend of mine who started like a dog products company and he actually joined a bunch of Facebook groups for like dog owners. And he was like, what's the biggest problem you guys have with dog products? And then just started running a lot of mm -hmm. polls, asking a lot of questions and it ended up the really awesome product that sold like crazy. That's awesome. And I just add that uh, I, I think it's important, uh, you know, we were just talking about data as well as like passion, um, having something that you're passionate about, it really does communicate to people, it'll come through your branding, uh, you, you know, just even with some of the discussion around, you know, creating kind of that, that group of rabid fans around something. I think that one, one area, though, that you'll want to also be careful of is, is just really looking to see, like, do the numbers add up? And, and, and kind of putting in what is what is my runway in terms yeah. of for trying out ideas. And, and don't be afraid to kind of test with your pennies in a number of cases. Like this is an amazing change that's, a, that's really happened over the past decade that has allowed us as creators, as, as people to come together. We're not part of major corporations to begin to test these things, to go out and, and go into that. And then, and then ultimately to find, find where you're going to be successful, kind of that matchup between passion and between the market where the market says a great big yes to your passion. Yeah. yeah. I'll, share, I'll share a quick story um, ju just on that. I recently had a, a chance to buy a brand and, and the brand, this brand is called Fever Dots. And uh, it was just two women who at the beginning of COVID um, kind of developed this product out of like this crystal ink. Um, you put you put this little sticker on on a kid's forehead, and if it changes to pink, that means they have ninety nine, you know, fever. And um, you know, especially during COVID, it's something that you think could be could be um, useful. Um, but mostly, this product really, you know, what 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 I found when I was evaluating this product, it's like it's a great idea, right? But then there's also like forehead thermometers that literally take a second to take somebody's temperature, and you're so you're trying to figure out, well, this is this is innovative. This thing turns from you know black to pink, and you can tell if somebody has a fever. But what's really what's really the the use case? How how are you actually going to scale this product? Why would somebody buy this product? And I kind of found during that data driven research that there's very limited cases where where somebody would would use this. And so while this is innovative, in my opinion, it didn't really have the data to back up that there was actually a need for the product. And that's where I've seen people who do have a passion for something and develop something that could seem like it's a great idea but it's not really backed up with passion. And, and then, you know, as you're thinking about where, where did this product fit? If I go put that on Amazon, Amazon is a 
search driven marketplace. So if nobody knows about the product, you need to educate people about the product, which means you need to go off Amazon to educate. And really it's more of a B2B product. You might sell them to schools or something, right? So like you really need to understand where you're going to sell the product and based on where you're going to sell the product, how are you going to go around marketing it? And is there actually, do people actually want this product? Uh, yeah. And that's really what we can figure out with this, with this product and why we almost could have bought it for nothing. Um, this, this brand, um, but we ended up just was, wasn't worth the opportunity. Um, and I think you want to make sure you're, you're backing up even something you're passionate about with data that it's something people actually uh, want. I know Sajagi wanted to, to jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, kind of what, what Benjamin was saying earlier uh, with like looking at the numbers. Uh, I feel like a lot of people make the mistake where they don't actually like calculate the numbers out like properly. Uh, like a lot of people don't factor in returns, like, you know, certain categories like apparel, clothes, there's a massive return rate, um, you know, versus like other categories, like, you know, maybe a lot less. So like factoring in return rates and just factoring in, you know, the other costs of doing business that are associated with that product, I think it is very important uh, to really get a clear financial picture of, you know, hey, is this like product actually going to be profitable? Is there actually a margin here that I have for advertising, you know, and running ads and, and whatnot? You guys have mentioned amazing things from community sourcing, making sure that you're, you have a community that's validating that this product is exciting, it it's serving a real niche and a real need, um, as well as really looking at the numbers and the data, having a true passion for, for a product or something really fuels and builds momentum behind you. Is there anything else you want to give people? I know, Benjamin, you mentioned testing. Is there any other ways that you guys have tested products in the past previous to going in like super deep on them? when do you know how to go all in um and and is there any other tools that you guys would recommend for people to use yeah, i mean I, I think one way i've personally tested products you know before launching brands in the past is just getting you know uh, half a dozen samples from a factory before actually placing a po and actually running the brand with those samples and testing the marketing with the samples before actually yep. placing the po to see if the numbers make sense to see if the you know, funnel or ads make sense and to see if the brand connects with the community. So, you know, I think people underestimate how much you can test with samples once you have them from a factory. Nathan, yeah. I, want, I want to ask you uh, maybe uh, before we go to Sajag, like a more direct question, even though it's not exactly e-commerce. So you um, you recently started a business in, in the last, I guess, year or so called Bubble Hotels, right? Uh, which is kind of like a, a unique concept. So how did you uh, maybe you could just sh share what that is and how did you actually know that there would be demand for, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it relates a bit to e-commerce because, you know, with Bubble Hotels, we, you know, launched uh, actually almost two years ago now and, and we tested it through a crowdfunding campaign. So I think a lot of products in the e-commerce world, you know, go the crowdfunding route and that's a great way to, you know, test uh, with samples. You know, you can launch a product on Kickstarter and you go, go with samples. And so, you know, obviously, uh, crowdfunding a hotel was a bit different than uh, just getting a sample, but you know, I think it's still uh, you know following a similar path in terms of you know testing with samples and trying to limit your you know upfront investment in inventory before actually validating the market. It's great. It's awesome stuff. So. One of the things that we know we've got to get to, because everybody's experienced this, if you're an established seller, you've run into a pitfall or two that is, you've probably regretted. Um, I think it's important to kind of name those ahead of time. Let's try to save some people some, you know, disasters that are unnecessary by sharing a little bit about some of the common pitfalls. You guys are working with sellers every single day um, in your various um entities and they're coming through, they're innovating, they're building new products. You've also launched your own product. So what are the pitfalls that you either wish you could have avoided in product innovation, or you're seeing people make on repeat that could absolutely be avoided if they took another path? So I think one of the biggest things, um, oh, sorry, was, was uh, I think someone else was talking. You're good. You're good. Go okay. for it. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Benjamin, you're uh, next. <laughs> yeah. So I think one of the biggest pitfalls I think people get is like, you know, kind of, I think earlier we kind of talked a little bit about it was like launching products that people don't need. 
Uh, but even if people need the product, like launching an unoptimized listing, I think it's kind of like a huge thing. Uh, so, you know, if you have a listing in place, like I did this personally with my products, this was like back like six years ago. So there were, you know, the testing tools and things like that weren't really readily available. Uh, but I launched a product that I thought was really, really awesome. And I had a lot of passion for it. Uh, but when we launched it, uh, we were just, you know, we were not sticking in the rankings and people were not buying the products. And uh, it turns out the main image wasn't good. And, um, you know, and then the bullet points could have been reordered differently, or there could have been some improvements, uh, you know, in a lot of the listing aspects. And um, so I think like testing out, you know, hey, what resonates best with customers? You know, what gets the best click through rate? Um, I actually went to a conference earlier with um, that was led by the Harmon brothers. And um, he was basically saying, you know, you can run like a bunch of Facebook ads with like a bunch of main images, or you can use an A-B testing tool. There's like one in the Amazon space, which is pretty popular, like PicFu. And just basically, you know, here's all like my 10 main images. Here's my 10 main product features. You know, just advertise one at a time and run 10 sets of ads and see what gets the most click through. So you can see, okay, hey, this is what's most important to customers. And then, you know, create a really optimized good listing, because no matter how good your product is, if you don't market it properly, it doesn't really mean much. Great point. I'd add to that, um, you know, product development is tough. Um, and so and so one of the first things would just be, we, we oftentimes see people being very, very uh, cost conscious at the very beginning. So you'll go out, you'll get a number of quotes, and you'll find that one quote is like 20% less than the others. And it's tempting. It's very tempting. But oftentimes what we find is, is, is that those products and those makers of those products it may be their very first time doing it. And so they're taking this like, you know, yeah. guess essentially at, at, at how much it's going to cost to make this. They may be a contract manufacturer and they just don't have the chops. They don't have the years of experience to know that these are really common failure points in this particular product category. So that's the first one. The second one that we see really, really commonly is somebody who comes in and they say, hey, I've got this idea for this product. And they've got about five different functions or functionality pieces that they wanna to add to a current product or, or a mesh of, of, the, of them. And oftentimes they don't do the work to just really go down and to say, what is the one thing? So we, we, we have a, a, something we call product plus one. And by that, we mean, what is the one thing that you could add to this product that will limit your risk going into this, you can go to somebody who's already established in a category and you say, this is the one thing that we're adding. And then from there, in your mind, you can create a roadmap. These are the next three things that we're going to add. And that roadmap will help you to iterate. But, but oftentimes we don't find the rigor that's necessary to do that. Um, and, then, and then the third one, at least to me, is, is, that, is, is that for groups um, that, 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 again, once you start to see, see bad, bad you know, information that's coming back, really deciding where, again, where is your runway? Where, where is the place that you're going to say, we're either going to keep fishing here or we're going to cut bait? I realize that there's stories on both sides that you'll hear from certain people, and they'll be like, we just hung on and I was down to the final you know, dollar, and then, and then it all came through. Versus a group that says, hey, we want to iterate fast, figure out what's working. We do the, we, we do focus groups and we go from there. Yeah, we, this came up in our last conversation that we had, but it's really easy to get attached to an idea or a product. And what you're mentioning is so critical, using rigor, using testing, and then also letting it go. Like if it's not, it, it's not making, then like being willing to let something go to keep innovating. That's awesome. Nathan, would you add anything from comments you know, I think or yeah, pitfalls? I think those are great points. I mean, I think there's um, a lot of potential pitfalls in, in production, you know, from uh, factories using different materials than they claim to use and having to double check that. And, you know, I think we'll probably talk more about that, you know, later in the discussion. But, you know, there's so many different pitfalls that happen on the production run specifically um, from, you know, false materials to, wire fraud to, I mean, there's, you know, so many pitfalls that we could all mention and dive into. Yeah. So yeah, I, you know, that's, that's what I would touch on. Yeah. Awesome. Well, <clears throat> one of the things we want to talk about is innovating quickly. So um, in e-commerce, we know that you've got to move fast. Like there is a lot of competition, increasing competition. E-commerce is exploding more than ever. Um, you guys have obviously been in this for 10 years plus each of you, but for some of the sellers in the room, this is year one and there's a lot of competition. So how do you innovate quickly, get ahead of market trends, 
but um, kind of like you were saying, Benjamin, you can also innovate too much to like, you can go skew the total opposite direction and not get that quality product in the market that really fits the need state. So how do you have functionality and differentiation while maintaining speed? So one of the things uh, we also talk about at Gemba a lot is this idea of how can you identify experts that are in your area where a short conversation with an expert, 15 minutes with somebody who knows, can oftentimes save you weeks, if not months, of just trying to figure something out. Yeah. And so, um, you know, some of you are probably familiar with the concept of that you need about 10,000 hours in an area to like really become an expert in something. And so how can you build a team of experts that can help you to start thinking about what this looks like, but then, but then ultimately to then test it and to test it quickly. Um, I think that this is always always a challenge because because like you have to be making inferences oftentimes off of products that like you're bringing a couple different pieces together. Um, so like for instance, you're looking at uh, the new trend and you're saying, hey, vegan leather is starting to take off. What would this look like if this was my plus one in the product in my particular area? Maybe this is, you know, in an area of like, say, pet products or everything else. But yeah. this is this is where you can start to pull that together. But you may find that just adding that expert at the right time in the product journey will actually help you to avoid weeks of like heartache um, that will yeah. that, happen. But then, you know, limit it. This isn't somebody that needs to be on your team permanently. It's somebody, though, that, that, that can come alongside, help you where you need it, and then, and then, then you can continue to move on. Yeah, I think uh, another point also to add, I feel like a lot of innovation, um, you know, in the space, I think a lot of it can come from your customers, right? It's just listening to your customers. And I feel like a lot of people don't really do that, <laughs> no matter how much they say they do and they want to. Um, so like, <clears throat> kind of going back to the community thing, I think like, one of the biggest things like I'm an advocate for is like, when you sell a product, regardless of where you sell it, um, you know, kind of get your customers into a community. And uh, try to build feedback loops between your customers. And like, we're not just talking like, hey, you know, leave a review on Amazon kind of thing, but more so like, hey, you know, like, you know, here's, you know, what do you think we can improve in your product? You know, how can we make this better for you? And maybe if you make a Facebook group and you're selling to a niche, you know, things like that, uh, you can get some feedback, you know, from that group. Like, hey, what do you, what would you like next? What would you like to see next? What are the other problems you're having? Things like that. Um, so I think like building a really good feedback loop is really, really important to, kind of get that feedback from customers. I love that. That's awesome. Um, we have quite a few sellers. Some might even be on um, the webinar today who built their entire product offering around being the, the highest quality that they could possibly bring um, to market. And um, really rather than looking for that quick sell, looking for repeat customers. Um, how do you build that product? How do you get that quality product where you have this craveable product that people not only love interacting with you as a brand, but they love interacting with your product and they can't wait for your next innovation because they believe in you so much. So let's talk about quality, making sure that beyond just getting something to market and beating the trend, you're actually putting that craveable, lovable product in people's hands. Yeah, I would I would start by mentioning one of my you know favorite games, Spike Ball. They have a lifetime oh, warranty gosh. on this product, and so you know when you put a lifetime warranty on your product, it makes you really think and spend a lot of time around quality control. Because if one of those plastic pieces you know breaks on your Spike Ball net, you know you can send it back and get a replacement piece. And so you know I know uh, at Source Five we just, you know spoken to their team and worked with them a bit, and it's just such an interesting you know, a dynamic for them as they have a lifetime warranty and spending so much time on the plastic that's in their, their product and uh, the net that goes on it too. And, you know, really just having such a, you know, defined quality control process. And I think, you know, that can be reflected onto, you know, sellers that are growing right now and maybe not at, you know, spike balls level, but setting a, you know, defined quality control process, I think is, you know, really important from the get-go and also, you know, thinking, outside the box in terms of, you know, what piece of my product could break down the line that we yeah. should really focus on, you know, when designing and, and building our product. I, I love that built-in accountability. It's like you're setting your own accountability for what the standard is, as opposed to letting 
you know, the market or the process drive that. I think that's amazing. I think Erica, what, um, what Sajag said about building a, a community uh, is really, really important here. So one of our, one of my clients sells keto snacks um, oh, yeah. on, on Amazon. And we were talking yesterday about, um, you know, a new product that they're, that they're launching. Um, and one of the things they said in, in, in the meeting with us is, oh yeah, like people are already waiting for this product. They can't, they can't wait for it, right? And that's because they've built an audience and they probably asked their customers what they want and then they're giving them what they want, right? So they're already building a product that people want and then they're kind of waiting for it because, you know, they're, they're, they're coming out with it. And then I think obviously marketing and positioning it the, the right way, right? This will be some yeah. kind of chocolate, caramel, uh, you know, keto snack. So I can just, I could just think of the, dripping caramel images <laughs> and put in front of people that'll be like okay yeah I, I want that right and when you do marketing that way and build a community around it um i think that's a great way to to get your audience excited about you know what what you're doing next i can think of another brand called uh crossnet um i follow i follow those guys a lot on on uh on on linkedin and you know they they launched uh they launched their net and then they launch a, a soccer product right like a volleyball product and they launch a soccer product and again that's probably from listening to their audience yeah. um and coming out with the next thing that that they want um so i think that the community and listening part is really really important to uh to do that yeah and, and just to kind of add on on more so the supplier side i think what kind of benjamin was saying earlier in terms of like sourcing and like not going with the cheapest supplier is like a huge yeah. kind of point like, yeah. you know, sure that last supplier might be 20% cheaper, but that 20% could cost you your entire brand if it's focused on quality. Um, yeah. So typically what I like to do when sourcing with suppliers is, you know, I, um, you know, first of all, you know, I really want to understand, you know, how they manage quality control. Can they answer questions? I like to ask like open-ended, vague questions about their quality control, their management, kind of how they handle processes, things like that. And the ones that really want to work with you and the ones that have good you know, protocols in place, they have machinery, they have labs, they have equipment uh, to test for that kind of quality and they do it on the production line. Now, here's the thing, they may not do it for your production, but there's a lot of factories that you know, may not have it at all. And if you don't have you know, the ability to measure, you have no ability to control. Um, and that's really kind of a key point. Um, so I would always kind of look for that on the factory side. And then in addition to that, um, you know, I, I think a lot of brands don't really do this, but um, you know, they kind of like, you know, I have a lot of exposure to this, obviously on the inspection side, uh, you know, doing quality control, but I feel like a lot of brands kind of like, hey, you know, inspection company, we hired it and story but every product is so unique and so different. Like kind of what Nathan was saying with spike ball, um, you know, if you can invest into like an engineer, like a manufacturing quality engineer or like a mechanical engineer or electronics engineer, depending on you know, kind of what your product is or a couple of them, you know, just hire a few on Upwork or somewhere else. It doesn't cost that much money and, you know, have them really dive deep into your products, into your specs, into how the factories produce the products and how to test for that. Then you can set up a really good inspection protocol that's, you know, significant every time you do an inspection and kind of make sure that quality is maintained order to order. So I want to, I want to throw out this question. There's a, uh, I'm saving some questions from the chat for, for later, <laughs> but um, Mike, Michael says we have a new market disruptive sleep aid device with independent sleep studies that support our claims. However, potential investors and customers always have ideas of other things we should be doing with our device. So having trouble listening to the feedback versus trying to be all things to all people. Um, how do I handle? Um, and, and then he follows up with, we're struggling with where to manufacture our product. Is China still the best answer in today's world? Really worried about quality quality control. Um, so I, I think this would be good to kind of go around yeah. with the panelists. Oh, no. um, I, never... I think, I mean, it kind of leans into exactly one of the questions I know we wanted to hit is what is like, how do you de-risk uh, your your sourcing? Like, what are those de-risk factors? And then also the first question, which is kind of how do you decide what to lean into the most? What the investors want? What the people want? And and, and I think one question to ask yourself: Somebody asked me um, in my own business, right? Like, you know, yeah, we, you could you could be doing twenty different things in your business, right? Um, but let's say you have a goal. Let's say your goal is to sell one million dollars in revenue in, in the first year with this product, right? The question is do you need all those other things to sell a million dollars in revenue of the product or like what what are the one or two key things you need yeah. with the product in order to sell the goal that that you have and if the answer is i don't need any of those other bells and whistles then i wouldn't listen to anybody else um until your customers probably tell you but um 
Um, what about China as far as like countries? A lot of people are looking to, to move away from it. Um, how would you how would you answer that as far as like, the, you know, is it still the best place to manufacture? Maybe with Nathan, then we can go go to. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would I would kind of, you know, touch on just with um, the whole China dynamic. You know, there were so many people during the trade wars that we saw, you know, in 2018 and 2019. And, and, and you know, just when the tariffs increased, so many people wanted to get out of China. They said, oh, we got to go to Vietnam, India, you know, Pakistan, all over. And so many e-commerce brands and companies rushed outside of China. And what they were met with is that the, you know, demand far outpaced the capacity of these suppliers there. And the other thing is too, you know, a lot of these factories that are based outside of China are, you know, potentially Chinese owned or they're getting their raw materials from China. So there's this whole, you know, inner working dynamic between factories across different countries that, you know, even if you're producing your product in let's, in, let's say Cambodia or Vietnam, you know, a lot of times the raw materials from that factory are actually still coming from China. So sometimes you're faced with longer lead times. Um, you know, different but in that in that case, you're you're potentially saving on the tariffs, right? Because the, the country of origin then becomes, let's say. Yeah, better. you're definitely still saving on the tariffs. But, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, still, I think a lot of the world's production is rely, you know, reliant on China. And a lot of that's you know, shifting and moving. And, you know, there's been a lot of mm. talk uh, you know, in, in today's world of South America and how, you know, that's trending for some products, too. But, you know, at the end of the day, especially if you're producing a pretty complex product, I still think you know, China is, is kind of your main source. And, it, and honestly, the easiest place to start, you know, it's the easiest yeah. way to go out and find a factory in China. It's uh, quite a bit harder to do so outside of China. Especially if it's an electronics, right? Which he seems to say it's a sleep aid device. So yeah. I, I yeah. think there's some kind of uh, electronic component to it, right? It's, it's going to be much easier in China. Definitely. And the infrastructure is there. You know, I mean, um, I can't tell you how many times in 2020 and 2021, where we were faced, you know, with lockdowns and shutdowns in India and power outages and all of that. And so, you know, if you even compare the infrastructure, you know, China's infrastructure for production is, is in a lot better place still than some of these other countries. So uh, I think, you know, you got to look at the, the, the big picture, not just, uh, you know, the individual. Immediate. Company. Yeah. And that brings up that question of when do you know when it's time to diversify? Um, because I know each of you are working in more places than China at this point. Um, and then when, how do you know how to de-risk given the dynamic environment that we're all in? Benjamin, I know you wanted to chime in on this. Oh yeah, sorry, I missed that. Uh, I, I think that, you know, it's kind of that that elephant in the room type of question where where, where people are, are thinking about this and, and you really have to ask the question, how much of, of the thought process is really just around a trend? You know, people are saying, you know, this or that. And the reality is, is, is that when you're talking about your business, th th this is a really, really important question because one, you need to identify who are you currently working with today? Like, like one, you don't want to have, you know, glass feet, you know, clay feet in terms of you, you want to understand your current manufacturer. If they are in China, understand how many design engineers do they have? What type of support is actually really going into this? Because this is an area that like we've seen a lot of suppliers really grow up quite a bit. If they're doing ODM work or they're doing design and other things, this is going to be difficult to replicate outside of, of, of China, at least today. Um, but and so and so like in, in the longer term, though, you may find, though, that you really do need to start to de-risk that you, you really need to start to say like, hey, we've either reached a size at which point we want to have multiple regions where we're where we're starting to get production from and or it may be something that within your value set and other things that you say, this is something that we need to do. And if that's the case at that point, then I think that there's a number of like hybrid strategies you can go into where you need to look at it, not just as this like binary, like one zero, like we're gonna go here and it's just gonna be amazing. The reality of it is, is, is that there's kind of this segmented journey in terms of going overseas or to a, like another place. And I'll just give the example of like, for instance, like the camping brand industry right now. Um, there was a lot of people who came, you know, last year and they said, hey, we wanna go to Mexico. We'd like to get our tents and our, and our chairs and, and all of these things out of the Mexico region. But a couple of challenges came up. One was extruded aluminum, right? Extruded aluminum, it's gonna go in your tent poles, it's gonna go into all of these types of things. Is the, is the market deep enough in Mexico or in, in India or other places, is it big enough to where that's gonna become a self-sustaining marketplace where they can do it in the quantities that'll drive the price down to where you, you'll see competition? 
Um, but that said, is, is that the answer to that may be initially no, but how do you begin to bring business to a place to tell them to, hey, this is a place that we want to be at, to give them the time to do that? And then how do you work with your existing supplier base to make sure that, that they're incentivized in the right way to where, to where they, they want to work with you on it? So again, it's, it's, it's a little bit more complicated discussion. But that said, is, is, is that there's going to be certain markets that are, that are kind of the hockey puck is going towards to where they're going to be similar and up and comers. And you have to decide as a brand and as a, as a person, are you kind of more of that person that wants to be on the frontiers? Like you like to be out there, you like to take on that risk, you like to, to, to get those rewards? Or are you somebody who really wants to focus in on a different part and you want to say, I just want to have a very stable, secure supply chain, understanding that there may be certain risks, but they're, but they're relatively lower. Yeah, and I also think like it's not like a you know all or nothing decision today, right? Like you can build your supply chain in China or wherever else, you know, in the next year or two, and you can change it around in two years, three years. So it's not like something, you know, hey, I'm building my supply chain in China and it's gonna be in China forever, you know, in a year when there's more infrastructure in Mexico or Vietnam or elsewhere and it starts looking more attractive and more stable, uh, you know, for your business, you can always move uh, to those countries at that point. Yeah, I think you guys are all hitting on this. Hey, beware of being hyper reactive. Make you know concerted efforts to take a look at like what's really going on in these places. Do can they handle the volume of what you need um, to do? And then, so Jog, I know you also take a deep look at like, is there going to be quality coming out of the manufacturers that are. Um, you're bringing on. Is there anything you want to add there about how to dive into the quality as you bring on a new manufacturer in possibly a new location? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, just to kind of like add on on the basis of like, you know, international economies, uh, like typically India, Vietnam and other economies, like there's really a hit or a miss. Uh, so some places like have like better quality, better provisions, like especially if you're manufacturing like in South Korea, for example, South Korea is a pretty Western uh, nation. It's pretty well put together, you know, I would feel like you have a, a lower risk of quality compared to China there versus, you know, some other countries. But, you know, in India, for example, there's very limited infrastructure. So like Mali, for example, we only operate in China. We are working on building out to India, to Vietnam and elsewhere. Uh, but one of the challenges that's made it so difficult to build into India, Vietnam, these other places is the infrastructure doesn't exist. The talent doesn't exist. We have to build up from the grassroots, um, you know, yeah. and build everything out from scratch. And there are also large companies, you know, large countries with very distributed uh, factories. You know, one factory could be in the middle of nowhere and there's not even a road to get there, you know, for the truck to be able to pull in goods. They have to like transport it, you know, with small cars or something like that. So uh, it just really kind of differentiates depending on the country. But, you know, in China, at least there's more stability there. But, you know, what I've seen as far as trends is that typically like even with China, what happened, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, is the larger companies will go in and put the money in because they get the best ROI to build out that infrastructure, to build out you know, contracts, get the factories going. And then the smaller companies typically follow. Uh, but even the bigger companies are just now starting to go to Vietnam and to go to these other countries. That's why you hear it everywhere on the news, but typically the smaller companies are a couple of years or you know, behind and they follow those bigger companies as they go. And I know from previous conversations with you guys that the the niche matters, right? Certain places are going to do better in certain like product niches, and that's important to look at also. Um, so it's a uh, hard. Well, actually, you know what? I want to ask one question. I'm seeing come through. Um, Dan Abrams asking, what about building supply chains in the U.S.? We actually haven't hit on that at all. I do think it's an important um, conversation to bring forward here and. There's, there's also more and more talk about that. How do we build up our, our supply chain in the US? Um, any thoughts on that from you guys? Now, this is something that we see, uh, we see a lot of people ask the question. I think it's a great question to ask because um, uh, you know, to, to Nathan's point earlier, a lot of times people don't realize how interconnected their supply chain is where they might say, I, I, I want to leave this country or that country, but then they find out actually they've got a lot of subcomponents into a raw material still coming from that from that country. Um, when we look at U.S. manufacturing, I think that the, it, it's it's important to know that like a lot of this stuff that unless you're at certain volumes, 
it's going to be sometimes difficult to find the right manufacturing partner. Like you'll get a lot of no's. And so you need to knock on a lot of doors to find the right group. But I think the other piece of it, though, is, is, is thinking about like, what is the strategic like advantage that you can have by having a supply chain that's very close? And a lot of times, uh, the, you know, you'll find things around like mass customization. So what does that mean? Like, what's something that you can differentiate your product with that adds significant margin, significant value to the product that you can be much faster than the rest of your competition because you are producing it locally? Um, you know, uh, approaching it with that sort of view as opposed to just going out and saying like, you know, immediately like, well, can you, can, can you beat this China price type thing? Yeah. Maybe yes, maybe no, but it's probably going to be at a volume that's, that's, that's pretty high. And so going at it and saying like, okay, let's talk with people. What could we do that's different here in the U.S. that would allow it to be customized and differentiated is, is, is a big part of the success that we see. The people that, that I've seen do it successfully have been oftentimes, again, they have a big established business and they'll actually go out and buy the machinery, hire the people themselves and, you know, sort of become the manufacturer themselves um, in the U.S., but t- typically not, a, not at, a, at a lower uh, cost. Um, I know, Nathan, you wanted to. Yeah, I would say, you know, it just reminds me of one of my best friends runs Moon Glow Jewelry and, you know, he's a just fantastic entrepreneur. And so, you know, Moon Glow, they create jewelry based on your moon sign. And so, you know, if anyone's still looking for a Valentine's gift, it's, it's a great <laughs> uh, gift. But, you know, they do all their customization at their own you know, warehouse in America and they import a lot of the raw materials from Asia. And so, you know, they have such an interconnected supply chain, but, you know, the actual customization that makes their product special is done in America and it's all made to order too, which is really unique as well. And so I think if you have a brand or product where you can add, you know, unique customizations to it, I see a lot of companies having success doing that in America, but in terms of if you're trying to do, you know, 10,000 units of the same product, it's going to be really difficult to compete manufacturing your product in America versus you know, in Asia. And, and, and even, uh, even your suppliers in the US, like if you're doing supplements, right? Many times those ingredients are gonna come from China or, you know, s- secret that that most most of the supplements are made in the US, but they're yeah. they're kind of put together in the US. And a lot of times the ingredients are coming from, from overseas. Yeah, and I, I would add, it's like, you know, look at it from a liability perspective. That's kind of one of my favorite perspectives to look at it. Kind of what Benjamin was saying earlier, you know, like, is there a value to having the supply chain closer? I think a big value point is liability. Like, you know, if you're doing supplements, for example, and you import your supplements from China, you're not doing the proper testing or you make a mistake because you're an uninformed, you know, uh, buyer of supplements, uh, you know, next thing you know, the FDA is making an example of you and, you know, you're facing jail time. And, uh, you know, a friend of mine actually went through that and, and it's not something that is good. <laughs> like you don't want to be in the middle of that. Uh, so, you know, if you have a product that, you know, can blow up or electronics or, you know, something that, um, you know, is edible, especially, um, I like to stay far, far away from external countries because there's just too many variables. Like, Hey, you know, if I, like I had, um, if, you know, someone reach out that wanted to buy chocolates in China and I was like, Hey, you know, don't do that because, you know, <laughs> you ship those chocolates overseas, you know, and, Next thing you know, there's mold growing in it because you shipped it overseas freight and didn't do the right testing. Now you're fully liable on the hook for everything and everybody who eats those chocolates. And that's just not worth the risk at that point. Those are awesome points. Um, One of the things that we've all discussed as as an additional way to kind of de-risk is building strong relationships with your manufacturers and suppliers. And I think we can't I don't want to close the conversation without addressing that. I think that's something that you each have expressed that you do and invest time in. I would love for you to provide some tips on building strong relationships with your manufacturers and suppliers. And why would you even do that? Yeah, I mean, so there's this term in Asia that, you know, most people are probably familiar with Guanxi. And it's like such a deep term that, you know, so many people can relate to, but it basically means, you know, relationships and how you establish and build and develop your relationships uh you know in this case with your suppliers and so you know for everyone here that probably knows there was just chinese new year happening and so you know one of the things that we do and we've been doing just you know with our factories is just little gifts you know gifts back gift baskets of you know fruit or candies or whatever it may be and um, we actually started providing that service to other people that aren't even you know using sourceify so you can send a gift to your factory through sourceify and 
a nice little gesture. So I think that goes a long way. Um, you know, I think the past two years with COVID, obviously we've all been kind of faced with not traveling to, to Asia, at least I haven't. I haven't been to China in, in two years and usually out there four to eight times a year. Um, and so just this, you know, different dynamic and, um, you know, just building a relationship and, you know, wishing them happy holidays or happy birthday or those little things really go a long way to develop uh, Guanxi. Yeah. And a plus plus one to kind of what Nathan is saying. And I, I you know, completely agree with that. Um, just send simple gifts like, um, you know, we sent uh, everybody, all of our contacts in China, um, like a Chinese New Year gift. Um, you know, it was like a tea set or something like that. We had somebody locally in China buy it and just ship it to everybody's address. And, you know, it just makes everybody, you know, super happy. So like, you know, regardless of where you're operating, you know, just kind of look at the local holidays when it's, you know, appropriate to give gifts and, you know, just give gifts, you know, send messages kind of as Nathan was saying. And, you know, I think that goes a long, long way into just building those relationships. Yeah, and I think that the the, the positive relationship portion of this is critical. Um, I, I will touch on a different portion of it, though, which is the rigor portion of the relationship, which is uh, I was just talking with one of our partners overseas this morning, and, and he was just talking about when, when he came on board it, within his organization, one of the very first things that he started was a, was a supplier uh, uh, scorecard. And that scorecard comes out every single month. And in that scorecard, you have things like, what's the price? What was the quality? What was the on-time delivery time for these types of things? And, and I realized that, that, that for some of you, it, it may seem like, you know, that's, that's not my really my, my focus, but I would say that if you can have a team if you can have that as part of your, your, your larger team, it's really important because then what you can do is, is you can say, here's the scorecard and it came out this month and we're dropping our buy by 30%. And it's like, it's like you can send very, very clear signals without breaking relationship that then end up incentivizing groups to start to be more on your team in terms of as a larger group. And if you've really followed that up with rigor, it takes rigor. You can't just do it like once a year type of thing, but then you'll find that your costs go down. You find that you can actually start to start to sustain your business. And ultimately when you compare your organization, your group with a different group that doesn't have that rigor, over time, the lines really start to diverge in terms of from a success standpoint. And it'll get you into a place that that, that, that ultimately you'll have lower costs, you can have higher, higher buy, you know, all of these types of things that, that, that over time, it's like that, that flywheel that, again, you, keeps going, but you got to have the rigor to, to keep it up. And it all requires relationship and people to be talking with each other. I think this is another nod to intentionality and, and consistency, right? And, and it's something when you're thinking about innovation, you're thinking about being reactive and in the moment. But what I'm hearing from each of you is that there's a ton of intentionality, a ton of consistency that goes into building a positive relationship with your suppliers and a powerful product that can sustain like the ebbs and flows of what's going on in supply chain. Um, we have a couple more questions. One thing I want to mention, though, that that needs to be said is that sourcing and product innovation and freight and logistics are not is like they're inseparable. So um, we know that this year, unlike this past year and the year before, have been extraordinary for most of our our community, as well as probably each of you and the various roles that you play. Um, what we are talking about freight and logistics in our next webinar. So we're going to spend the whole time talking about it. But as you guys are all looking to the future and you're thinking about sourcing and freight and logistics, what are you thinking about? What are you advising your community towards? Um, what should these guys think about as they're thinking about sourcing? Yeah, I think um, the, you know, just in time inventory used to be like the gold standard. Um, and I think just in the last year or two, um, and kind of the biggest kind of my point is that standard has basically been thrown out of the window <laughs> that doesn't exist anymore because there's no such thing as just in time inventory uh, with the pandemic and that's really been clear um, so I think like having more inventory in stock and you know being very careful with it I think is huge uh, I think it's very important and you know obviously um, you know with my personal experience you know running a several million dollar electronics brand and you know, we sold accessories and things like that if that inventory is bad and you have, you know, six months or eight months of inventory in stock, then, you know, your brand is in a really precarious position. So 
really make sure that you know you take the time to do your diligence and uh, you know when you order inventory and keeping enough in stock. Yep. No, uh, it, a lot of what we're talking about for 2022 is is just for people to prepare for this to to last much longer than perhaps you you might have thought it would. Um, yeah. What we're seeing, you, you know, you, you can see this with with groups like the CEO of Flexport, who just came out last week and was talking about, uh, you know, what's really going on. You know, it's 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 you know, the ships are now being moved outside of sight range so that so that people can't be doing the counts, you know, outside of the ports and other things. But but really, you know, I think that one, you want to make sure that you're educated in terms of what are some of the milestones. How do you know that the season's changing? When, when, when is the winter thawing? Uh, these types of things. If we get to summertime and this is not resolved, like, like if this doesn't get resolved at the ports and other things, this will continue. The second thing, and I think it's really important, is, is that you don't have to just be captive to, to the, the, this issue. Really looking at it and saying, what are key components that we would be willing to move faster? We had a lot of uh, clients who came to us uh, last year and essentially they'd been waiting for weeks to get stuff out of the port when for $1,000, $2,000, they could have moved it, but they somehow the signal wasn't getting up to the, to, to the right place to where your, your current logistics group, they may be your, your 90 percentile group and you wanna stay with them. But have in your back pocket, what is the 10 percentile? What will you be willing to move? And then how do you make sure that your organization can sustain that? Because especially for smaller organizations, like, like you're kind of holding your breath, you're just waiting, are, are we gonna make it? And so kind of knowing what, what are the options, being proactive about it, and then, and then, and then continue to move into that, to, to watch for the seasonal change, I think is gonna be the key in 2022. Awesome point. Amazing. Well, um, we had a few people say that they'd love to stay in touch with our panelists. We've dropped the links um, to each of their organizations um, into the channel. I want to remind you guys that our, um, I'm bringing up this, this slide really quick, that our next um, our next webinar is solely focused on freight and logistics. We know this is a major, major thing that everybody's trying to optimize this next year. Um, and we're thrilled to continue to bring those insights forward. The insights that have been provided in this webinar have been amazing. I can't thank you guys enough for joining. Um, this will be available to you guys. We'll be following up so that you can all watch it again and dig in and also really encourage you to reach out to our amazing panelists um, who've joined us today with any further questions. Um, and lastly, if you guys want to sign up for a growth plan or you want a eight fig to help you keep your inventory in stock by uh, infusing your supply chain with more capital, we're thrilled to be able to support you. So uh, reach out to us at eightfig.co or you could sign up for a free planning session um, in the chat. Um, thank you guys again so much. Thanks, Laron, for being with us every single time and uh, really appreciate you guys, Nathan, Benjamin, Sajag. Awesome time. Um, can't wait to connect with you guys soon. So appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.